Hey everyone, how's it going? Today we're going to be talking about Grumman. Today, known as Northrop Grumman, after the merger of both Grumman and Northrop in 1994, Grumman is perhaps most well known, to me anyway, for their excellent line of fighter aircraft, generally carrier-based fighters, from the Second World War. Planes such as the F-4F Wildcat, later outclassed by the Japanese Zero, but would still serve admirably throughout the war, the F-6F Hellcat, with over 12,000 being produced and being a dominant force in the Pacific, and the F-8F Bearcat, appearing too late in the war to make any significant mark, but still making a name for itself as a rather popular racing plane. When it came to carrier-based aircraft during the war, Grumman was arguably the most prolific and successful. I mean, there was the Corsair, which wasn't Grumman, but, you know, room for debate. Some of the more interesting planes to me from that period, though, are the lesser-known ones. We have the F-4F, the F-6F, and the F-8F. But where are the F-5F and the F-7F? Well, the F-5F was a prototype design that didn't really go anywhere. Not that it was actually bad or anything, but Grumman had something bigger and better on the horizon. Something that they envisioned would be the biggest, fastest, and strongest carrier-based fighter in existence at the time. This is a plane that one test pilot would call the best damn fighter I've ever flown. This is the Grumman F-7F Tiger Cat. Its story, of course, has to begin with the F-5F prototype, the Grumman XF-5F Skyrocket. This design was built in response to a design request from the Bureau of Aeronautics in 1938, design request number 144. In this request, the Navy sent out a list of specifications to a plethora of companies, where they asked for a plane with a weight less than 9,000 pounds, a stall speed no greater than 70 miles an hour, a range greater than 1,000 miles, an armament of two 20mm cannons and two 30 caliber machine guns, a 200-pound bomb load, and as high a speed as they could possibly achieve. From this request, three major models would be up for consideration. The F-5F, the F-4U Corsair, and the Bell XFL Aerobonita. The Grumman model would stand out from the other two by being the only twin-engine model up for consideration. Additionally, the F-5F was also rather unique in that the wing would extend past the nose of the fuselage, sort of looking like a fish holding onto a plank of wood. All three models would fly around the same time between April and May of 1940, where the F-5F and the Corsair would separate themselves from the Aerobonita. While the F-5F did have greater issues than the Corsair initially because of some engine cooling issues, and drag problems from the extra engine, among other things, the F-5F would also have an incredible rate of climb that just about no other Allied fighter could even come close to matching at the time, reaching 4,000 feet per minute. The British Spitfire actually came in second place, but it was a distant second. The Corsair was well behind, at 2,660 feet per minute. The Corsair, on the other hand, had fewer initial issues and would have a greater top speed, 404 miles an hour to the F-5F's 386. Ultimately, even though the F-5F clearly had merit, and with a bit more seasoning, it likely could have been a great fighter aircraft, the Corsair was selected for production largely citing the comparative simplicity of the design. The twin-engine outfit of the F-5F was more complex than the single-engine Corsair. The F-5F would even be passed on in favor of Grumman's own F-4F Wildcat, citing similar reasons. 
Still, despite being passed on, Grumman would continue work on the design and general concept of a twin-engine fighter. And yes, while they were more complex, the increased power offered by the second engine, combined with the fact that the F-5F still had solid maneuverability and handling, gave Grumman the desire needed to refine the idea. That refining would come in the form of the F-7F Tiger Cat. The F-7F would actually come about the very same day as Grumman's own F-6F Hellcat, both designs having a prototype ordered on June 30th, 1941. The F-7F was in response to a different need from the Navy, though. While the F-6F was to be an upgrade of the F-4F, and a contingency plan in case the development of the Corsair went sideways, the F-7F was in response to a call from the Navy for larger fighters that would reside on the upcoming larger Midway-class carriers. And while the F-7F would technically be a derivative of the F-5F, looking at the two side by side, it would be rather difficult to see any significant similarities in their designs, apart from the twin engines. Measuring in at 13.82 meters long, 15.7 meters wide, and 5.05 meters tall, the F-7F would be about 5 meters longer, 3 meters wider, and 1.5 meters taller than the F-5F, significantly larger. With an empty weight of 16,270 pounds, and a gross weight of 25,720 pounds, the Tiger Cat was more than twice the weight of the F-5F and akin to that of a light bomber. Outfitted with two Pratt & Whitney R2800 double WASP engines, each with around 2,100 horsepower, a significant amount of power would be behind the Tiger Cat giving it a top speed upwards of 435 miles an hour at 22,000 feet, with a rate of climb of 4,530 feet per minute, greater than the F-5F, and even greater than the late war versions of the Corsair and the F-8F Bearcat. Performance-wise, the F-7F would be the cream of the crop of propeller-driven aircraft. Adding to this incredible performance would be a just about unmatched armament, consisting of four 20mm cannons with 200 rounds per gun, and four 50 caliber machine guns with 400 rounds per gun in the nose. Underwing, the F-7F could be outfitted with two 1,000 pound bombs, or an assortment of rockets, torpedoes, and or drop tanks. This would not only make the F-7F a potentially incredibly damaging fighter, but a proficient ground attacker as well. Effectively, the F-7F was designed to be a heavy fighter bomber. In the upgrade from the F-5F to the F-7F, the Tiger Cat would take on a more traditional body design. The front-mounted wing section and the stubby fuselage would be replaced with a fuselage and nose that extended past the wing like normal. Additionally, the tail section would also be changed from a twin-fin twin-tail to a more standard tail with a single central vertical fin. The F-7F would also be fitted with tricycle landing gear, noteworthy for the fact that it was the Navy's first carrier plane to have tricycle landing gear. It should also be noted that early in the F-7F's design and prototype construction, its name wasn't actually Tiger Cat, but rather the Tomcat. Not officially named the Tomcat, but rather a name given to it by initial flight testers and designers. The name just kind of stuck. So Grumman would send that name off to DC to make things official and the name was denied. The Navy would state in their letter of denial that the name Tomcat was unacceptable as it, and I quote, denotes feline promiscuity. For a weapon of war, the fact that the naval higher-ups would be annoyed at the idea of feline promiscuity 
is certainly something. I mean, a lot of planes and bombers had pinups on the noses, so why was Tomcat where the line was drawn? Regardless, the name Tiger Cat was sent in as a replacement, and it was approved. Funnily enough, decades later, Grumman's own F-14 would have the name Tomcat, with the name now apparently being socially acceptable. Anyway, though, the Tiger Cat would first fly on November 2nd, 1943. Only a small hop in a taxi test, but it technically counts. Over the next month or so, the Tiger Cat would embark on several flight tests, apparently very successful. And then, on December 5th, 1943, the prototype was nearly lost in a flight test that also demonstrated the power and performance of the F-7F. Being flown by Grumman test pilot Corwin H. Meyer, also simply known as Corky, Corky had been flying the test flights of the Tiger Cat since November 10th, and he was incredibly impressed by the sheer power the plane had. On December 5th, Navy higher-ups stopped by the Grumman plant to see how the F-7F was progressing and to see the plane in action. Corky then, according to his account, took off and immediately began climbing, climbing at a much greater rate than something like the F-6F Hellcat. Then he dove and hit 400 plus miles an hour before pulling up for a high-speed low-level pass. Corky then realized he was flying a bit too low, and right in front of him was a flagpole, which forced him to quickly pull up to avoid crashing the plane. He then proceeded to perform a Cuban 8 loop, seen here, before being radioed to land. Back on the ground, Corky was immediately summoned to see Grumman's vice president of flight operations, who was infuriated. Seeing Corky almost crash the F-7F, from his perspective anyway, the vice president absolutely laid into him and gave him a week off without pay basically a week-long suspension. Fortunately for Corky, though, he was not fired. Testing on the F-7F would continue through that year and into 1944, when the first official production models would be delivered in April. As they were designed to be naval aircraft, the F-7Fs were immediately sent off for testing to determine if they were carrier-capable. Not only would they need to be able to take off from a limited runway, but they would need to be able to land on that same limited runway. Something that would assist in this is a tail hook, where what basically looks like a crowbar extends downward off the tail and hooks onto a metal wire on the carrier deck, which helps slow the plane down considerably. While the Tiger Cat was sufficiently able to take off from the carrier deck, it would end up failing the landing portion for two reasons. One was the tail hook, and the other was the twin engines. The F7F design used a different tail hook than what was Navy standard, so it effectively failed that part automatically. Presumably, that part could have been overlooked. But the bigger issue was that the single engine tests of the F-7F showed that it lacked directional stability, and thus if an engine was out, it would simply be too dangerous to land on a carrier deck. Because of this failure, production and design of the F-7F would shift over to being a land-based aircraft. 34 F-7Fs, full name F-7F-1, were made and delivered before this production and design shift. With it not really working out right now as a carrier-based fighter, it was decided to continue production as a night fighter, under the name F-7F-2N. In this new model, the cockpit was changed from a single seat to a two-seat, and to fit the radar technology necessary, the four nose-mounted 50 caliber machine guns would be removed and an APS-6 radar was fitted. 65 of this variant were produced. In an effort to remedy the control issues that made the Tiger Cat fail the initial carrier tests, some improved R-2800 engines were fitted, 
and the tail section was enlarged on the original fighter variant. These efforts did end up fixing the stability issues, and even gave improvements to the top speed, now up to 460 miles an hour. But during the new round of carrier tests, a rather rough landing resulted in one of the wings being damaged and structurally compromised. This made the new model Tiger Cats, the F7F3, fail the carrier test once again. Despite this failure, 189 of these were made, becoming the most common Tiger Cat variant. Additionally, some improved Night Fighter variants with new engines would also be ordered, these dubbed the F7F3N. Alongside yet another attempt to make the Tiger Cat carrier worthy, with the F7F4N with an improved tail hook. 60 and 12 of these models, respectively, were produced by the end of 1946, and the 4N variant would finally pass the Navy's carrier tests and was approved. As you may have noticed, though, despite the initial intention being that the F7F would serve in World War II as a carrier based fighter, the fact that only the post-war variant passed these tests meant that only a select few of the non-carrier variants would be adopted in time for the end of the war. Plus, it wouldn't have worked out all that well anyway, since the Midway class carriers the F-7F was built to serve on did not appear until after the war ended. Regardless though, in mid-1945, two marine squadrons were being trained on the F-7F, and these squadrons were en route to Okinawa to serve against Japan. However, the very day the F-7Fs arrived to the Pacific Theater, Japan surrendered, so the Tiger Cat was just barely too late to serve in World War II. If it had managed to participate in combat, the F-7F would likely have been the fastest and probably the most well-armed plane in the U.S. military at that point. Luckily, if you want to call it luck, the Tiger Cat would have an opportunity to serve about five years later in the Korean War. Of course, also at this point, the incredible performance that the Tiger Cat offered wasn't really incredible anymore. By the end of the Second World War, America and most other major powers were well into testing jet engine technology, and by 1950, planes like the F-86 Sabre, F-84 Thunderjet, and P-80 Shooting Star had all been adopted, and were outperforming the Tiger Cat with speeds easily over 500 miles an hour. Propeller-driven aircraft, fighter aircraft at that, were still used with some P-51 Mustangs and F-82 Twin Mustangs serving, but their viability as fighters was rather poor, and they served better as ground attackers and in other roles. Nevertheless, some F-7Fs were used in combat, recon, transport, and various utility roles. Officially, just two planes were shot down by the F-7F, and they weren't exactly the most technologically advanced planes. Two PO-2 biplanes flying some recon were taken down. As far as I could find, these were the only two air-to-air -air combat kills by the Tiger Cat. It was also reportedly used in ground attack roles and served well although I could not find any stats on what it actually managed to do. In the end, like so many late World War II aircraft, the F-7F got caught in a tough transitional stage. Too late to serve in World War II, but too early to serve in significant numbers in Korea. A major technological shift was on the horizon late in World War II which left a good number of solid planes like the F-7F and even the F-8F to some extent being automatically relegated to the dustbin of history. Regardless of that though, the F-7F was probably one of the best fighter aircraft made during the Second World War. 
To go back to our boy Corky, in 1948, Navy test pilot Fred Trapnell came to Grumman to test out the Grumman Panther jet fighter. While he was there, Corky, a massive fan of how the Tiger Cat flew, would pester Trapnell on why the F-7F wasn't pushed for. Trapnell responded by listing several deficiencies of the design. The engines overcooled, longitudinal stability was poor, single engine control was also poor, etc., etc. Corky countered him by pointing out that Trapnell actually personally flew the Tiger Cat quite a bit, almost exclusively, to which Trapnell praised the Tiger Cat for the power of its two engines, solid agility and control, excellent forward visibility, and excellent range, concluding by telling Corky, it's the best damn fighter I've ever flown. Alright, and with that, we're going to go ahead and end for today. So, thank you all for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. In all honesty, the thing that made me want to do a video on the Tiger Cat was the whole Tomcat naming fiasco. It's just such a strange bit of pearl clutching, I guess? Weird sensitivity to the idea of feline promiscuity for something that was designed to kill people. God forbid people think about cat coitus when they see the murder machine. I don't know, though. Maybe they thought it was communist or something. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope you learned something. So, see ya.